Hi everyone, welcome to the second lecture for Ecocriticism 101, which in a way is sort of the first lecture insofar as today, for the first time, we're going to be dealing with literature proper. And this is what we're going to be doing for most of the rest of the term, except for something a little special at the very end. Anyhow, um, if you go back into the Western tradition and you look for sort of ground zero where literature emerged, if you look for the first major work of literature in the Western tradition, this is it, the Epic of Gilgamesh. In fact, as I'll note in the lecture, it's so old that it predates written language in the West. So this was originally like a number of epics, like um, you may know Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. They were not written down. They were actually sung for a long time, and there was an oral tradition. That happens again, actually, with the first great epic in the English language, which is Beowulf, which was also sung before it was written down. So this, in a way, goes back before written language is in the West. That's how old it is. And you might think then that, you know, what could possibly be learned from it from an environmental point of view. But I think there are a couple of major things we're going to get from it. First is this nat uh, nature of um, nature of the idea that nature and culture are sort of this entangled dyad or couple. And second, uh, deforestation, which is an issue in the West. So, yeah. It's hard to believe that it is so old that it would have that for us, but it does. It's also worth noting that up until hmm, maybe 30 years ago or so, no one approached the Epic of Gilgamesh from an environmental point of view. Everyone just read it for a range of different ways. And there had been some very um, important groundbreaking work, say, the way feminist critics viewed it. And as you read it, you may, you may see a number of flags there for an issue like that. And there are some people called eco-feminists who both approached it from an eco-critical point of view and a feminist point of view. So, well, why don't we just jump in and um, you can see what this is all about here. So, here we are. Oops. And notice that we finished with the introduction here. Now we are in Mesopotamia. So, let's just jump right in to this. And here we go. Um, so we're going to be dealing with a number of things here, the Epic of Gilgamesh itself. We're going to talk about the city, some characters, including Gilgamesh, and this notion of a genus Loki figure, which is important, and then talk about the cedar forest and, and how all this works for the Epic. So let's start with the Epic itself. Um, I'm actually going to read this first part because it is just so good. He had seen everything had experienced all emotions from exaltation to despair, had been granted a vision into the great mystery, the secret places, the primeval days before the flood. He had journeyed to the edge of the world and made his way back, exhausted but whole. He had carved his trials on stone tablets, had restored the holy Aeana temple and the massive wall of Uruk, which no city on earth can equal. See how its ramparts gleam like copper in the sun. So I'm going to actually go to another section of this too. But you know, if there is an argument to be made for new criticism, and remember from the introductory um, lecture we had, new criticism is the idea that there are some things in literature that sort of transcend time, transcend their historical moment. And I would argue that this is just that. In other words, yeah, maybe it's 5,000 years ago that this guy Gilgamesh lived, but the way that it is being portrayed here yeah, really resonates um, with the modern world, I think, because there are certain basic human things. Um, this may not resonate with you, by the way, um, but maybe when you get to my age and you realize that, you know, um, what, what's being talked about here is just, you know, unlike so many other epic heroes like Beowulf or Achilles or Odysseus, you know, what is, is singled out here as the important thing for Gilgamesh is that just he survived, you know. He jumped straight into life, lived life, and, and you know, went to the very edge of the, the, the world and came back exhausted but whole. Where, where the, the, the epic conquest here is really of life itself and to have endured. Um, again, that may not make a lot of sense to you, but maybe when you get to my age, you'll, you'll reread this again and, um, and see. Um, because I, I think it is it is absolutely great in that sense. And you can see why people would have read it this way for, for quite a while, and even before the new critics came on the scene. 
And, you know, also note here what's being said about Iraq, you know, which no city on earth can equal. In the Western world, the city, Gilgamesh the city, which is being talked about here, Iraq, um, was, you know, the single largest, most important um, um, city that had ever been made in the Western world. There are plenty of other civilizations or a few other civilizations in different parts of the world, and they have their own claim to fame. But with this particular civilization in this part of the world, nothing is going to equal Iraq. So let's jump to the uh, next section, which I'll also uh, suffer you to, to hear me read. Climb the stone staircase, more ancient than the mind can imagine, approach the Anna Temple, sacred to Ishtar, temple that no king has equaled in size or beauty. Walk on the wall of Iraq, follow its course around the city, inspect its mighty foundations, examine its brickwork, how masterfully it is built. Observe the land it encloses, the palm trees, the gardens, the orchards, the glorious palaces and temples, the shops and marketplaces, the houses and the public squares. So, remarkable description here of, of what this city is like. And notice that, you know, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but just to kind of a spoiler here. Note that it's a walled city, and within the walls, everything is being talked about, all these things. It's, this is as much as an accomplishment as anything else, the city here. And it is Gilgamesh is the person who is responsible for making the city what it is. And we're going to see, in part, how he does it. And again, not to be too much of a spoiler, but it involves the exploitation of natural resources. It's the only way that this something like this can be done. And, and this is going to sort of haunt Western thinking for, for quite a while. So let's jump past this. So, let's talk about Iraq a little more, the city. So, how, you know, would you describe Iraq? I think it's a fair question, one that we should think about, you know, because you're encouraged, and, and it's striking, because these are, are, are literary devices in a way. You're supposed to sort of have an imaginative walk around there. So, the, the author or authors, we don't know who wrote this, you know, um, is or are encouraging us to sort of walk around and as we're walking, explore all these different things. I think the, the big takeaway is, especially in its moment, its era, this would have seemed like an extraordinary accomplishment. I mean, there, nothing had been done by human beings to equal this. This was just a remarkable achievement. I think that's the feeling you're supposed to have as you go through it. But let's let's actually walk around a little. First off, it's surrounded by a wall. In this case, the greatest so far in history. And an important point here that we normally, so you may be familiar with this sort of uh, construction, not so much with cities, but like with a, a castle, right? Castles are surrounded by a wall. You know, even in Disney movies, they have a drawbridge that drops down. You pull up the drawbridge, no one can get in. People try to, you know, siege, um, lay siege to the castle and try to get in. But it's important to note that it's not only in a small way are there walls like that, but cities had walls. If you go to a city like London today, you can actually go through the city, even though it's expanded well outside of its walls at this point, but you can go through the city and see where the medieval walls were. So it's an incredibly ambitious project because you're, 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 walling a whole city in to protect the people inside. Now, if you are if you think of something like a castle, you think, well, yes, you're protecting it from other people and marauders who would come in or whoever and try to take over. That's true. But also, one of the major functions of a wall around a city like this, whether it's medieval London or, you know, um, ancient Iraq, is to protect it from the environment. What I mean by that are animals especially, wild animals, right? Um, you can't have things like wolves walking around the streets of a city, and, and they may well do just that, right? If there's garbage and everything, they'd come right in. How do you keep them out? Well, the remarkable achievement is the wall can do that too. And in that sense, if you think about it, you know, since that is a major function of why the wall is there, right off the bat, it's a, it should send up a flag that the environment, you know, what's wild out there, outside of human encroachment is seen as kind of scary, 
For most of history, nature is going to be seen as scary. It's where bad things are. It can be bad people. You know the story of Robin Hood and you know his merry men living out in the forest. That that had a ring of accuracy to it because that's where criminals went. They went outside of you know the jurisdiction of where people could get to them, and they lived in forests. And as a consequence, like in the medieval period, if you were traveling through um, a forest in England, yeah, you, you'd want to have, if you were a wealthy person or if you're anyone, if you could afford it, to have an armed guard to protect you because all sorts of people are out there. But it's people and animals too. And and in England, for example, in the medieval period, they still had wolves ranging free. They didn't, you know, uh, drive them into extinction until the really the early modern period. So, it's just something to think about right off the bat that the environment is being postulated as something scary, something dangerous, something that needs to be held at a distance. And we'll talk about that a little more because it's an important distinction here. Um, with respect to the wall, observe the land it encloses. All these things, you know, palm trees, gardens, orchards, you know, um, even agriculturally here and what I mean by reference to this, you know, gardens are not a naturally occurring thing. These are planted, right? People are planting gardens to grow food, they're planting orchards to grow fruit. And as a consequence, everything inside those walls is artificial. There is no celebration here of look how it looks like, you know, wilderness or something. That's going to come much later. If you've been to New York and you've seen like Central Park, you know that um, Olmsted, the guy who designed that, actually tried to make it look like wilderness, you know, so it was actually like a little wilderness area inside of a city. Yeah, not here. Everything here, and it's a celebration, has been changed by human beings. They've created this environment. It's a new kind of an environment separate and apart and different from the environment that naturally occurs. It's what we would call a built environment. You could call anything a built environment, but this is an expansive one, right? I mean, it's it's a wall, you know, blocking it off from everywhere else and then building something in there, something that's entirely human. So, there then is a distinction here between country and the city. And it's obviously in place 5,000 years ago, and it's still, I would argue, part of our cultural memory today. It very much shapes what we mean by nature. So what do you mean by, what do we mean by nature? Well, we're going to you know, come back to that question again and again throughout the term. But here, it's very clear that what is nature, you know, what's, is what's outside of the walls. It's what human beings haven't touched. And what is culture Culture is what's inside of the walls. Everything there is is culture and cultivated. Even the the agricultural part of it, I mean, even the you know the plants and all, what is agricultural? That's agricultural. That's it's all culturally constructed by human beings. So you can call that as a, a binary structure. You mean two things that are sort of linked together. Um, you could call it nature and culture, or you could see it in its most basic form here. You could see it as um, country and city. The country is what's outside of the wall. The city is what's inside of the wall. This distinction is going to be with us today, but here it emerges. Not arguably necessarily the first time. We really don't know. And, and that's an important aside to make. Um, what did people think about before Gilgamesh's time with respect to this dyad, this binary structure of country and city or nature and culture? Well, we, we really don't know a whole lot about that. I mean, you might be able to infer some things from you know, like physical or um, archaeology or, or anthropology. But we know this because it's encoded here. It's written down here. We know what these people thought because they're, they're talking about it in this work. And as a consequence, we know that at least back this far in the West, there was a distinction between nature and culture. So let's talk about that a little more. And I think it's it's our first example and a good example of, of how a modern concept it came into being a long time ago and, and remarkably 
kind of hard to believe. It's still alive and well today. So the idea of what is natural, what nature is, first began to emerge here. And in this case, between the distinction of country and city, were natural and unnatural. And that's still alive and well today in the West. I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a moment, but one thing to note is this is not the case with every culture, every human culture on the planet. There are other cultures that don't have that distinction, that don't see a distinction between human beings and what we've done and nature. The, to say that those two are separate um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense for certain people. So an example would be Buddhism. Buddhism um, at, at its core believes everything is deeply enmeshed and interconnected. And, you know, in that view, we are in nature too. We're part of nature. We're not separate and apart from it. So it's, it's, it's just intriguing to think that in this particular flavor of culture in the West, this idea emerged and never went away and continues to be on. So Let's jump into that a little more. Um, in the next 5,000 years of literature that we look at, you know, um, we're going to see this binary structure, these two things together, locked together, um, continue on. And the really interesting thing is it's going to get inverted. Uh, not that... And what I mean by that is it's still going to be two very different things. Nature and culture are going to be seen as very different. But in this case, you know, which one of those is being privileged? Well, it's it's culture. Culture is, you know, everything we just read here is a celebration of culture, a celebration of human achievement. And we're going to see as we get further into the epic, you know, what's outside the wall is kind of scary and all. Today, we think of it differently, right? And, and if you don't believe me, walk into any supermarket, especially sort of a high-end supermarket like, you know, um, Whole Foods or something, and it's a celebration not of culture, but of nature. Everywhere you, you'll see, you know, natural this, natural that, or organic, which is a way of sort of quantifying it in, a, in an actual legal way that if you get organic vegetables, they're natural in a certain way and they're guaranteed to be natural to have the organic label. Um, but everywhere, um, and of course, na nature, it, natural itself doesn't really mean anything. And what I mean by that is um, you can put that label on anything. You can say anything is natural. The government doesn't regulate that the way it does with the organic label. But everybody wants something natural. People gravitate towards it. Marketers know that. That's why they put, you know, those labels on to say things are natural. So it's not only that this endured over time, it, it morphed and, and flipped in a way, but is still profoundly influential in our culture today. And again, walk into any store, uh, especially those that sell food, and, and you'll see it. The nature culture dyad is alive and well. And things that, like with food, that are the most cultured, what I mean by that are, you know, that hmm, show the greatest um, amount of human intervention. So that food that has been heavily processed and all, you know, that's human beings working on it. That is, of course, seen as to many people inferior. And the thing that you want most is to get that apple that pretty much nothing has been done to it, that, you know, no fertilizers have been used, no chemicals have been used, pesticides, herbicides, anything like that, that it is just as natural as possible an apple, rather than buying some sort of apple product or, you know, things like that. So it's interesting. Um, and I think it's our first case uh, of seeing how influential this tradition has been. And we're going to see lots of different examples throughout the term, but there is one that, you know, um, when you walk into a store and you see all that going on with natural and organic, yeah, and that's 5,000 years of Western culture being echoed and, and on display for us. So it's pretty intriguing. Yeah. So this is the description. It's clearly a celebration of the artificial. And again, I think it's kind of hard for us to kind of wrap our heads around that, as it probably would have been hard for Gilgamesh and people, his era, to wrap their heads around what we have today. Because clearly this is meant to be like 
a celebration of the greatest human achievement so far, um, this amazing city. And, you know, um, today, you know, we would, we would, you know, we tend to, to frown on things that are sort of overly constructed and overly built, but not here. There's, there's absolute um, triumph of the, the human accomplishment of being able to do something like this. Yeah. Um, hold on. Did I just have this one again? Yeah. Sorry. There's a uh, a flaw in the Prezi. We just had that one twice. But anyhow, there you have it. That's Iraq. Iraq is interesting in its own right. Fascinating. Fascinating to read about. It. Interesting to think about it historically. But on the other hand, interesting because it reveals something about that culture that is alive and well today in our culture. I'll buy it in a very different way. So let's talk about Gilgamesh. Um, who is Gilgamesh? That's the question. Um, he's likely an actual person um, who lived 4,600 years ago or so. We're not sure, maybe longer than that. And I note here, as I did in the introduction, that this goes back so old that it predates written language um, and it was an oral tradition. But what's intriguing to think about in terms of our last lecture, the introductory one, when I said that, you know, the study of literature can bring something new to the table. Well, it does here um, because we would know very little about Gilgamesh. Um, in fact, let me show you in the next slide. Um, yeah, there is Gilgamesh. Um, so we know a little bit about him independently of the epic, and that's why we can say with some confidence he was a historical character, an actual king. But we would know very little about him. I mean, could you infer things from this representation? Sure. But the account that we have, and it is, you know, we, with any kind of literary account, or, um, you know, we have to take it kind of with a grain of salt. We have to think about, you know, how accurate is it really? And and with this one in particular, when we see the, we're going to talk about in a few minutes, the great expedition to the cedar forest, that has to be, you have to kind of read through it to see what that's really about. But there's a lot about the culture that's here. So even if Gilgamesh is being, you know, sort of, you know, puffed up and described in a rather inaccurate way, okay, fine. And even if the description of the city here is sort of inaccurate, it still reveals things. You know, even if the city wasn't that great, these people wanted their city to be that great. This is sort of like, uh, you know, the Nickelback song Rockstar. They're trying to represent it as a, as, a, as an amazing place. Um, and whether they achieved it or not, is in some ways uh, less important than the fact that they wanted to achieve it, and maybe did. We don't we don't know all that much about the city, although it was rediscovered um, in the 19th century. So here's a question: How then would you describe Gilgamesh? Was he a good king? Um, what was his attitude toward? people, especially women. So I'm not sure whether you've read this already or intend to read Gilgamesh afterwards. You can do it either way. And um, if you haven't read it, then you know what I'm about to tell you is going to be kind of a spoiler, but it might help you read it and, and look for passages that are important. Um, yeah. This is a quote, of course. The city is his possession. He struts through it, arrogant, his head raised high trampling its citizens, right? Here's the, the king, right? He's trampling its citizens like a wild bull. He is king. He does what he wants. No one is going to oppose this guy, right? He takes the son from his father and crushes him, takes the girl from her mother and uses her. Um, by the way, uses her is a reference to rape. Um, the warrior's daughter, the young man's bride, he uses her. No one dare to oppose him. Um, yeah, so in the beginning of the epic, Gilgamesh is not a nice guy. And as a literary work, it's interesting because there is a trajectory and he will become a good guy at the end, but he's clearly not at this point in time. And, you know, um, it's especially apparent because you would hope a ruler, you know, any leader would really care about um, his or her people. And this person doesn't care about their people at all. This person cares about, you know, himself and, and is very selfish. Um, one thing I want to note 
here I note in the second next slide is um, note that part of the objection here is the daughter and the bride are the possessions of some man. So let me go back and I'll show you what I meant by that. Um, that's here. You know, takes the girl from her mother and uses her. The warrior's daughter, the young man's bride. Um, clearly, in that sense, you know, it's you can see where like a feminist reading of this text would be revealing too, is because you know, in part, the issue is of what this horrible thing that was done. This woman was taken, a young woman taken from her mother and raped. But on the other hand, you know, it's it's the warrior's you know um, daughter, the young man's wife. This is you know uh, should be the domain. And and, and sort of the chattel or property of another man, and yet Gilgamesh is transgressing that boundary. So that's disturbing too, right? From a, with the feminist reading that women are seen as sort of you know belonging to a man, either initially to a father, and then ownership sort of transfers to a to a husband. That should obviously, to our modern sensibilities, be enormously disturbing. But that's this culture here. So anyhow, not a nice guy, Mr. Gilgamesh. Um, What's ironic here is that he's a he's a horrible ruler, right? And you know he's abusing power. He's an actual rapist, but he's called the protector of the people. So it's very clear that the view of what a sovereign should be, a ruler should be, is someone that has a responsibility to their people and is a protector of them. And Gilgamesh is really failing badly here. And by the way, the the whole thing about um, using woman raping and all. Um, we're going to see it when we get to, to Enkidu in a, a moment. Um, what's at issue here is there's, in other cultures, um, maybe if you've seen the movie Braveheart, I don't know if anyone still just watches that. Um, it's a Mel Gibson film from years ago. In many cultures, including in England in the medieval period, which is what's talked about in that film, um, the culture functioned by allowing the sovereign on the wedding night to be the first person to sleep with the bride. And that was a privilege that the sovereign, if they wanted to, could take. And Gilgamesh is, is a, having, has that privilege here and takes it whenever he wants. And, and that's the idea of it. And that's written into the culture. That's their sort of legal code and all. But you can see this is a culture that's having a problem with that, right? So, I mean, maybe that's the way things worked, but yeah, that's not the way it should work. I mean, certainly the people who are composing this are, are having a problem with that. And um, we're generally a problem with Gilgamesh, um, with abusing power. Yeah. Um, what's great about the epic is that um, even though he's a pretty horrible guy in the beginning, he, um, you know, um, comes around by the end and becomes the true protector of people. And, and that's, of course, reassuring. Um, and it's also intriguing from, from a literary point of view that we have um, pretty sophisticated technique here that, you know, we, we want that from characters. We sometimes have characters that have fatal flaws and we, we like them to, to grow throughout the, the work itself and to by the end. And certainly that's happening here. But the, the key thing to note is this notion of being a protector because we're going to see this in, in other characters as well. Yep. So another literary convention is the idea of doubling. Um, we still have this today, um, but all of that means is you have two characters who are very similar. And when you talk about the characteristics of one, you're sort of invited to compare them to another. Gilgamesh and the person we're going to talk about next, Enkidu, are doubles, you know, they're, they're virtually as strong, which is amazing because Gilgamesh is seen as this almost, you know, godlike or demigodlike power. And, you know, Enkidu is every bit his equal. But one of the things that's really interesting is that Enkidu is from the very start central to who he is, is a protector. And it's not that he's doing that by law or something, he is a natural protector. So when you look at these two doubles together, it is very apparent that there's something wrong with one of them, which is Gilgamesh. You know, he's supposed to be a protector and he's not. Here's this guy, Yankidu, and we'll see for in a moment, he's like a natural protector. And these characteristics can reveal things about each character by way of the other character. So just hearing about how great Enkidu is, is going to make Gilgamesh look worse and worse, even though we're not talking about Gilgamesh, you know. It's just you're invited to compare the two. So, 
Let's talk about the character Enkidu. So who is Enkidu? Traditionally, the answer to this question has been that Enkidu is the wild man. He's the wild man of um, the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, because he lives outside. He is outside of the wall, right? Everybody's inside of the wall, except like for some farmers and all. But this guy is, is sort of way out there, not necessarily in distance, but he's pretty wild. He has very little connection with human beings. We don't know how he got there. We don't know anything about his family or anything to speak of, most of the versions, but he's out there uh, living with animals. So in terms of that nature and culture dyad, yeah, this guy's nature, and, and, and that's not good the way it's imagined in the beginning. So let's talk a little more about him. Yeah, but in addition to being this wild guy out there, he's also a protector. And um, do you recall what he protects? I'm actually, I'll go through them for us so we can see. And again, if you haven't read it, sorry to be a spoiler here. Um, initially, um, he's a protector of animals. So he's a wild guy out there. And he sees himself in opposition to human beings insofar as he's protecting animals and human beings are trapping and killing animals. And because Enkidu's on duty, he's going to stop that. So uh, farmers put out traps to catch animals. He frees the animals and rips up the traps and throws them away. So um, no one has put, given him that job to be a protector, but he, he has assumed that job and he's a protector of animals. Then, um, the second thing, and this is sort of jumping ahead a little on the story, but the next time we see uh, Enkidu as a protector is um, of a bride. So the whole thing I just told you about where, you know, the sovereign, in this case, Gilgamesh, would have a right to go in and have sex with a woman first on the, um, you know, the, the uh, um, honeymoon night, I guess. Yeah. But anyhow. Uh, Enkidu is mortified that Gilgamesh is doing that. And once he comes inside the walls and is fully human or becoming human, he's going to stop that. So Gilgamesh, you know, happy as can be, goes there to um, to rape the woman and Enkidu is standing at the door. You know, he stood like a boulder blocking the door. So he's clearly same protector, but now not animals, but in this case of women who he feels are being, you know, unjustly treated as, as we do today, of course, I think that. Um, but then he becomes, after his decisive sort of battle with Gilgamesh, and they realize that they're like equally powerful and all, they become friends. And, oops, sorry about that. When the, um, trip begins when Gilgamesh and Enkidu go to the cedar forest, you know, the elders turned to Enkidu and said, you know, we leave the king in your care, protect him. That's the word. And during that journey to the cedar forest, Gilgamesh, Enkidu does just that. So he's sprawled like a net across the doorway. So that's repeated. And that, that's sort of an indication of that this is in an oral tradition. What I mean by that is if it's sung, it's sort of like a refrain of a song that comes back again and again. And that one comes back. So like at every night, just the same way that he stood at the doorway blocking Gilgamesh from coming in. Um, now he's stood at, standing at the doorway protecting Gilgamesh from anything else. And ultimately in this decisive battle, which we're going to get to, with um, Humbaba, which is this uh, protector of the forest, um, he protects Gilgamesh there too. So if you didn't get the point, you know, early on with the animals and the bride and all, just keep reading. This guy is through and through a protector, it protects different things, but that's, that's what Enkidu is. Um, and immediately after being fed by the shepherd, hold on. Uh, Enkidu went out with sword and spear. He chased off lions and wolves all night. He guarded the flocks. So this is a really interesting aver uh, um, addition. And I've, I've given out things out of chronology a little just to, to talk about how he protects Gilgamesh. But once Enkidu fully becomes incorporated into human culture, we, we, the epic talks about how that happens. Um, he then shifts his role. And it's striking, right? Because he's the guy who protected the animals. Now he's the one who protects um, the flocks, you know, domesticated animals from lions and all. So it's it's very striking. And it's um, it's also an indication, as just sort of, you know, says, you know, out loud that this guy has made the jump. He is no longer natural. He is in, in inside with culture. 
erzählen. Ja, um, yeah, he inverts the role. So he's still protector and all, but now he's protecting, not protecting animals uh, from human beings, but protecting human interests, flocks, and people from wild animals. And, and he can do it because, you know, Enkidu is so powerful. So it's interesting that, you know, Gilgamesh and Enkidu are doubles. They, they're, they're so much like each other. And, and again, you can see in Gilgamesh what, you, know, you can see in Enkidu what Gilgamesh needs to become and all. But there's another double here um, for Enkidu. And um, yeah, and this is a different kind of protector. And, and let's get to him. That's the next character we deal with. And that is the character of Hom Baba. So, who is Home Baba? Do you remember from the epic, or if you haven't read it, you don't know? Um, well, if you bought into the language of the epic, Home Baba is a monster. And if you're familiar with something like Beowulf, like Grendel and Grendel's mother, they're monsters, and he's portrayed the same way. So, you're not getting this from his perspective, and you're not even getting a sort of an objective, um, which we're going to try to, 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 to work out here, a view of who Hombaba is. But from the epic, he's just this monster that's out in the cedar forest. But first and foremost, he too is a protector. So if you've got the theme here that Gilgamesh isn't a protector, will become a protector by the end, Enkidu is a protector in all these different ways. Hombaba is a protector, but in just one way. He's there to protect the cedar forest, and he's put there by the god Enlil. Um, and he has one role, which is to protect the cedar forest. Now, what's interesting about that role? Let me let me go through, and I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, well, okay, I'm going to go back. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, what's interesting? You see, like Enkidu protecting human beings from animals, protecting animals from human beings, going back and forth. All that this guy is doing is protecting the cedar forest from human beings. This is a wild place. In a nature culture dyad thing, this is wild. And it has to be protected from human beings. And this is the guy to do it. Just to be clear, he's not there uh, to protect the cedar forest from animals. He's not there to protect it from demigods or gods or anything like that. He has one play, one mission, one thing. It's to be a protector, protect the forest from what? Human beings. This is a very, this is the next slide. This is very common in ancient um, uh, religions and, and not so just ancient ones, some that survive even today. In this case, uh, in the case, in these cases, certain features of the environment, and we're talking about like rivers, mountains, in this case, a forest, had what's called a protector of place. So again, we have the protector idea. Um, the Greek term for that, which you will we'll be seeing again and again, and you'll encounter it a lot in literature of religions and um, literature like we're doing, is genus Loki. Um, genus, uh, we see it like genius, our word, but in, in um, the original, this meant uh, protector. And Loki, um, our word locale comes from it, right? So Loki means place. So a genus Loki is a genus, a protector of a locale, of a place. And they're there, and they're appointed to protect the place. Again, not from animals, not from gods or storms or anything, but from human beings. Hombaba is a pretty classic genus Loki. We could look at dozens of different religions and belief systems across the planet throughout, you know, the last few thousand years, and we'd see genus Loki figures all over the place. Um, Hombaba is a very good example of one, and it's so interesting because he's a, he plays a central role in this in this text. Uh, yeah, does not protect a place against animals or gods. Um, this is important because it sets up, again, a binary structure and opposition, right, between human beings and, and places. And in this case, human beings um, are not walling off nature, but they want to go out into nature. And there have been prohibitions put there to keep them from doing that. These are, oops, sorry, these are religious prohibitions. So let me do the last one and then I'll frame this whole thing better. 
It's a consp- genus Loki figure, a conspicuous feature of religion is to call um, the worship of the earth rather than the worship of a metaphysical god. So what's all this about? So if you're a human culture and you know you don't have science and a way of understanding your place in the world like we do, you probably think of yourselves as um, as pretty weak and at the you know the whim of the natural world. So give me I'll give an example. Say you live near a river. Well, you know. If you don't know what we know about how climate works and things, you don't know why sometimes that river almost goes away during a drought, in which case, you know, you and your fields and all could, you know, um, you know, be really harmed. It could kill you. Or alternately, you don't know why in a great storm comes around, your whole, you know, village could be washed away if the river floods out. So if you don't have that view and understanding you know, of natural processes by way of modern science, you might believe that the, rid- the river itself is controlled by a deity. If you don't have an overarching metaphysical god, the way we'll see like in Christianity and all, um, you may believe that the, the world around you is full of deities. So that river has a deity, a forest over there, maybe the cedar forest has another deity, and that's just the way it works. If you want to um, you know, survive, you need to make nice with the deity. So we'll talk more about genus Loki figures um, in a minute or two, but it, they're, they're very important and they are remarkably pervasive throughout um, human culture more generally. So let's talk about them, genus Loki figures. Yep. These deities are not like um, the Judeo-Christian God. They are not imagined as being in another realm, like heaven, like a metaphysical realm. There's nothing like that here. They belong to the earth. They are moored to the earth. They are part of the earth. They, they are the things of the earth. They are the river. That's the God is the, you know, the, I'm sorry, the genus Loki figure is the river, is the mountain, is the forest. They are there. They're there to protect it. And they're often not distinguished even. But in this case, we have a genus Loki figure that's a very definite um, figure that we can see, an actual sort of anthropomorphized figure. In some cases, just the river is seen as that sort of protector. Um, So in order to, you know, make nice with these deities, the idea is that you have to to see them as as sort of um, protectors of what is a sacred place. So the river has to be seen as sacred, right? Because it's it's this scary thing and, you know, you can't control it and all you have to realize is very important. You have to not try to to harm it or exploit it because if there's a god or a, you know, genus Loki involved, um, that entity could, could wreak havoc back on you. So it's very important that you kind of make nice with the genus Loki figure. And what that means is you cannot just randomly overexploit a place. Um, let's talk about this more. Um, typically in these religions, human beings can use the resource of a place, but only to a limited amount. So what do I mean by that? So let's say the cedar forest, how this would have worked. Well, there's imagined being their great god um, to controls it. And in this case, the god has put a sentinel there, a genus Loki figure. Well, if you want to go in there and cut some of that wood, you you can't just indiscriminately do it. This, this is the domain of a god, right? You, you can't do that. Um, what you have to do is, say, make offerings and there has to, there often is a very um, um, detailed, prescribed way of doing it. So you may come in, you may go there and, and you know, make offerings, go through some sort of ritual, and you could take out a few trees. You know, you could selectively cut older trees that, you know, um, wouldn't harm the forest too much by doing it. And supposedly the God will allow you to do that if you're respectful and do it carefully. 
if you think about this, this is done for for religious reasons, um, cultural reasons, and you can see why. But from a modern environmental point of view, hey, that's pretty cool because it kept people from, you know, randomly overly exploiting places, and it meant that people had to act respectfully toward features of the environment. And something like what we would do today, like clear cutting or something, that's totally off the table, right? How could you go ahead and clear cut? something that belonged to a god, that god, I mean, <clears throat> the god will become very, very angry with something like that, and you would have to deal with the repercussions. So it was, it's, it's not set up, and I want to be clear about this just for an environmental view, point of view. Um, sometimes it, it is in a way, but <clears throat> it often means that we would, the people living there would approach the natural resources at their um, disposal in a very sustainable way by not overly exploiting them or, in fact, exploiting them in any way. Um, so this particular genus Loki, Hombaba, is there to protect that particular forest. He's there, and you know you have to go through him to cut down that forest, um, and and that's why he's he's you know this great protector figure. Um, incidentally, and I put it in parentheses here, uh, this was a real cedar forest. We we know that it existed in this time. We have you know archaeological record. It was corroborated in like the Bible and other documents and all. So this was a place that actually existed that in, during Gilgamesh's era, the, they came in and they clear-cut this forest. And how that happened, how could that have happened if there had been a religious prohibition? Um, and that's what this epic is about, how that was achieved and, and who achieved it. And it was done really because of the ambition of a single guy, which is um, King Gilgamesh. So let's talk about the cedar forest. Um, this is when they actually are going there, and um, this is Gilgamesh and Enkidu. You know, they cast huge weapons that ordinary men could never carry, axes that weighed 200 pounds, knives with cross guards. So um, jump to the next slide. What's interesting here is, you know, um, the principal weapons that they're carrying, you know, they have knives, yeah, but they're not what you'd expect. Swords, spears, shields, there's no description of that. What there's a description of is axes. Now, I know there are battle axes and we see them, you know, in, uh, in Homer and all, but it's odd that that's the main focus here and when we see them deployed. So it's described as a battle, you know, um, you know, but it's really at root an expedition that was sent to cut down this forest. I'll talk in a moment about how it's not just two guys, it's it's a whole army of people going there. But what this story is about is talking about a historical event that happened that this forest that we know was there was cut down. How did that happen? Well, here's the story as told by the people who did it and you know, how they were able to do it because they had you know, this religious prohibition. And like if you were an archaeologist and you think, well, I know a little bit about their religion, but how do they overcome that religious you know, prohibition? Here's the story. So let's go through it a little more. Um, it, it's, you know, important to think that it's it's about how a genus Loki was defeated, the so-called monster, Humbaba. But beyond that, it's how a whole religious tradition was defeated to allow this to happen. So it shouldn't have been allowed to happen. The religion in place should have stopped something like this from happening. And traditionally, it has in other cultures. That's one of the, the features about genus Loki figures. If you, if you find a culture that has strong genus Loki figures in place the way it was before Gilgamesh, you can be pretty assured that they have a pretty sustainable relationship with their environment. But this changed, and this place, you know, the, the whole story, sorry, there's a plane flying overhead. The whole story here is kind of a cover story about the battle with this monster and all. It's really about a logging operation. So they took their axes and penetrated deeper in the forest. They went chopping down cedars. The wood chips flew. Gilgamesh chopped down the mighty trees. Enkidu hewed the um, trunks into timbers. Um, and they cut down the, the highest of trees. So um, let me jump from this description into what that really is. Um, 
you can see that as an epic battle, but yeah, I mean, look at it carefully. It's it's not. It's a logging operation. That's what we're talking about here, um, which sent logs down um, from the cedar forest down the Euphrates, and they actually talk about it here, to Uruk. So how does it work? Well, you have Gilgamesh. He's cutting down the trees, <clears throat> and he stands not for one person, the way it's described here, but it would have been a whole, you know, army of people um, doing this. One half or one portion would have been cutting down the trees. The other, the other one, which was like Enkidu, were processing them on site. And let me go back and um, show that part. You know, Enkidu, and this is from the epic, um, hewed the trunks into timbers. So that distinction, if you're not familiar with it. A log is a round tree that's been cut down. Um, if you've seen like timber frame buildings and on the word here is timber, um, like timber frame barns, you know that they're square rectangular pieces of wood. So half the people symbolized um, by Gilgamesh here are cutting the trees down. The other half, um, like Enkidu, are hewing these into, um, into square timbers right there, or rectangular timbers right there on site. That would have been made sense because you wouldn't have had to deal with all that wood waste and everything and you wouldn't have all the little branches and all if you just like drop the trees into the euphrates they went down the river it would have been a lot of unnecessariness but so they actually you know cut them into usable timbers there that could be used by the city and of course this is how and this is how Iraq, because it's become such an amazing city, because it has all these resources to build it. How do you build all these houses and buildings and structures? Well, you need, in this case, wood, and here's how they're getting it. But it's very clear that when you look at the, the text, this is not an epic battle. This is not, you know, um, the Iliad or, or Beowulf. This is a, a logging operation. Um, yeah, heroes, just two men but symbolically stand for thousands of men who took, who took part in this. Um, I couldn't help but note here, it's actually uh, kind of like other expeditions that I didn't give our most recent president that I could have given in this context, but George W. Bush, who wanted to go in and open up the natural resources of Alaska. Um, not a great forest, but the oil resources there, which are considerable. Um, yeah, and kind of a spoiler for the whole term, in that case, there were protectors of place that stopped him, and those are modern environmentalists. So if you want to kind of like skip ahead and wonder whatever happened to the genus Loki figures, yeah, they're alive and well today. We call them environmentalists. Um, it's in some sense a cover story for – let's just call it what it is, deforestation, mass deforestation. And that's what this story is about. It's not about two guys going out and defeating a monster. It's about, um, you know, a culture wanting to, you know, develop further and needing resources. And there was something there that they could use, the cedar forest. And they went down, they went and clear cut the whole thing. That's what this story is about, clear cutting a forest. Gilgamesh yelled, he lifted his massive axe, he swung it, it tore into Hobama's, um, Hobama's neck, and uh, at the axe third stroke, he toppled like a cedar and crashed to the ground. So Hombaba is symbolic of the whole city, right, of the whole forest. He's there to protect the forest, but he's like a double for the forest. And, you know, um, we could have talked about Gilgamesh dropping all these trees, but this is a decisive moment in the epic because once that deity, that's that, you know, semi-deity is destroyed, then there's nothing to stop Gilgamesh and the expedition from clear cutting. But Gilgamesh has to be the one to do that in a way, which is to overcome that religious prohibition. And we're going to talk in a moment about how that's achieved in the epic, and it's uh, it's intriguing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so his defeat, you know, you can see it again just as a monster being killed by a guy with an axe. But it's really, you know, um, that he's a double for the forest. And this whole thing playing out with three kind of doubles, right? Gilgamesh being a double to Enkidu, being a double to Baba. It's not just three people. It's, a, it's an army of people. And it's not one tree, you know, that's being toppled. It's, it's a whole forest. Yep. 
um, little tidbit here. So we know that historically it was an actual forest, but we know here, know also that it was an old growth forest. We have brought to the earth the highest of the trees, the cedar um, um, whose top once pierced the sky. By the way, if you if you go and uh, put, you know, um, Lebanese cedars into your search engine, you'll see what these trees are like, and extraordinary massive trees. But the way they're described here, they're, they touch the sky. And so no one had gone in and done this before. And that's what made the forest so prized because, as you may know, you know, old growth forests, they, they can be huge, hundreds of feet tall, depending on the, the type of uh, trees, and they can have matured uh, without any human intervention, so they grow very tall. And in the United States, there are very few old growth forests. They were often cut down during different periods of our like settler culture and all. Um, but here, this is, um, this is the most prized of natural resources in that sense. Um, genus Loki in Gilgamesh. Um, as you know, the title character, Gilgamesh, who stands for the city of Uruk, attempts and succeeds at nothing short of sacrilege, at defacing a sacred site, um, which was protected by a genus Loki. So then the question is, how does he do that? Right. Um, you know, he may be an arrogant guy. We know we know he's an arrogant guy who takes what he wants and does what he wants. But, you know, can you really take on a god and do that without worrying about ramifications? Would would anyone let you do that? Right? Would the would the people allow that expedition to go there, knowing that they might suffer the consequences from a god who's you know this is a god's private forest? And do you really want to um, you know um, worry about how a god would respond? Well. Um, yeah. Also note here, and eco-feminists have looked at this text and note that um, there's something here that is disturbing from like a gendered point of view, that this scene is seems a lot like rape, that they penetrate the forest, that they go into the forest that way. And in fact, um, the language used here is, you know, um, gripping their axes, their knives unsheathed. They entered the forest. They took their axes and penetrated deeper into the forest. So there's something about Gilgamesh's character that he's willing to, 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 to um, you know, deface things and attack in this way. Um, and it's, um, again, eco-feminists have shown uh, provocatively that there is an interesting um, parallel there with uh, the earlier character. But let's talk about earth deities because Humbaba is, as a genus Loki figure, and all genus Loki figures are for the most part earth deities. Um, let's talk about that. Um, eco feminists, uh, continue talking about this approach, have long argued, and it's the argument's interesting, um, that a shift from female um, gods and to male gods, male deities, occurred sometime before the Epic of Gilgamesh was composed. So um, frequently, um, they're like little stone carvings you can see that go back like 30,000 years or more. That's a trinity, and it's a three-part trinity of the maiden, the matron, and the crone. And you can see this in um, even in Homer's time, like the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which is a story, if you know it, about Persephone and Demeter. But they're, they're three-part deities. They're all female. There's the one part, which is um, um, called the maiden. That's uh, a woman before, uh, before marriage and uh, usually prepubescent. Then there's a woman figure known as the matron. That's a woman during the period of their life when they're reproducing and having children. And then often called the crone, which would be Hecate in the American to Demeter, which is a postmenopausal woman. But the idea is that this is seeing a woman in three parts and the focus is on the fact that women can give birth and and bring life into the world. And arguably the case in Western culture, that those were the original deities because people were trying to figure out how like life happened and everything. And it all kept coming back to women because women were the ones who, who had this ability. Um, but that is going to change at this period in time. Um, so 
what you see here in the Epic of Gilgamesh is a shift from a matriarchal deity. So the cedar forest is actually home to the goddess Ishtar, who is feminine, to a male one, Gilgamesh's champion, the sun god, which is Shamash. So um, in terms of that, I just talked about how we may have gone from a matriarchal religious system to a patriarchal one in the West. We see a female goddess here in control of this forest, but there's a male god on the scene now, which is Shamash, who is the sun god, who, um, just to be clear, is not of the earth. He is not a genus Loki figure. He is not an earth deity at all. He's the sun god. He's, he's up there in the, uh, the sky. He is separate and apart from the earth, which is significant and important. Um, it's also the case that, as in this story, you have a female deity, and here it's a ruler, um, that not only is, um, is given the power of creating life, she fashions Gilgamesh and presumably all other human beings from clay. So we still have um, that religion, the older uh, um, matriarchal female religion in place, because, again, who can create life? Well, it will be women who create life and female deities here. Um, that myth, uh, I'll call it that story, um, reappears, of course, in Genesis, and it reappears in the Greek culture um, with the Pandora story. But in those cases, it's already, that role has, because these are going to be coming, because Gilgamesh is so old, the, the Hebrew test in the Bible is still a couple thousand years away. In a couple thousand years, there's going to be no doubt it's a male god, and the male god is given that role. So who can give life to everyone? It is... It is, you know, the God of um, um, Genesis, Jehovah, Yahweh, um, Adamai, whoever, he has a lot of names, um, who can do that. And it's a male God, but here it's not. So again, we're, we're, we're still in this older period in a way and transitioning into something new here. Um, it records here a decisive moment in human history when earth deities were, in the metaphorical image of the epic, defeated by human beings um, with the aid of a metaphysical deity. So what do I mean by that? Um, Shamash is the sun god. He is he's not a metaphysical being in the sense that we're going to see with the Judeo-Christian tradition where this god is who knows where he is, he's where heaven is or his realm, but it's clearly not on earth. It's clearly not here. He has another home. And um, what we have, though, with Shamash is a, a god who is more powerful than any one region on the earth, right? He's the sun god. He's above earth altogether. And this is Gilgamesh's god. So, and he's also, in terms of this eco-feminist reading we've been talking about, um, he's male. And this male kind of metaphysical god, certainly not earth deity, is Gilgamesh's champion. So why can Gilgamesh do this act of sacrilege in this earth-based religion? Well, because there's a new god on the scene now, Shamash, Gilgamesh's champion. And Gilgamesh doesn't have to answer to these old, these, you know, regional deities. He has a bigger, more powerful god on his side. So can Gilgamesh do this on his own? Well, they, they can. I mean, this expedition happened and they did it. But what give, gave them the religious, you know, um, um, license to do it? And it's the fact that they have this new God, and this God allows it, and this God is is bigger and more powerful. So Humbaba is a powerful deity, but look, he's not that powerful. You know, in the in the epic, a couple guys can can fight and defeat him, but you know, you, how could you defeat the sun? I mean, this is a far, far, far more powerful deity, and and that's the argument. And so, did it? also record a shift from a matriarchal to patriarchal religion? Maybe. There certainly are indications here, and in the eco-feminist reading of the text is pretty compelling. But it certainly meant a shift from earth-based regional religion um, features, where like a, a forest is protected by this deity, or, or you know, a demigod, and then a river by this one, and a mountain by this one. All that is sort of trumped by this big god up there who is, you know, um, protecting everything. So, it's a very indecisive moment. Um, 
But what does that really mean though, right? So when human ambition, and, and Gilgamesh is described as having, you know, the most ambition of anyone, um, becomes strong enough, earth deities such as, you know, genus Loki figures protecting the environment, they have to go, right? I mean, if, if the, the goal is to grow that city and make it even, even more powerful than it is, it's the biggest, greatest city so far in the West, well, you know, they need those resources, so something's got to give. And, you know, a new way of looking at religion where is a god that is not part of the world Sorry, it's another plane flying overhead. Um, not part of the world, but outside of it can, again, sort of trump all those local religions. Um, and it almost had to happen, right? Because if, sorry, I'll let the plane fly by. It's, it's actually late at night here. Uh, not super late, it's like uh, pushing 10 o'clock. There aren't too many planes flying by, but I guess there's one. There's always one. Um, but, you know, this is, something's got to give because there, it's not the case that the culture could continue to grow and care about the environment in the same way. And again, the goal is not expressively to care about the environment. That's not what's being said here. But what's being said is that, you know, um, these protectors of the environment, they, they have to go. There's no way that they can be, um, they can be allowed to exist uh, um, if that's the goal. And so it's intriguing. And it's so fascinating that this is, again, the first major work of literature in the West, and yet it records this very issue in detail. Because we're going to see this again and again. We're going to see genus Loki figures again and again throughout the West and the need to dispense with them. And generally, it will have this balance of religion insofar as you're going to need a new god if you're going to displace these old ones. And if you're, you know, and, and you need to displace them if you want to get at these resources, those little gods, you know, scattered all over all these genus Loki figures, they got to go. And to do that, since this is, you know, in part a religious issue, you're going to need a new god and a, a new god that's more powerful than any feature. So in this sense, you know, you can kind of see the epic of Gilgamesh as a truly environmental epic. One that records how a desire to use the resource of the environment overcame an earlier religion based on the earth. So this then becomes in part the story of the West. So you can read it from like a religious point of view, a shift from, you know, earth-based religion, which by the way, you know, are all over the planet. That, that's what originally there were. And till today, and there that's still all over the planet. And certainly, I mean, we, we probably, you may know them most through like Native American spiritualism, which was sort of a very much an earth-based religion, did not have metaphysical deities, had genus Loki figures. All those were part of that. But we're going to see it when the, um, the original Celtic religion of England encountered Christianity and all. The same thing happens again and again. Um, but in that sense, um, you know, is, is it a religious issue? Sure. And we can address it as such, but it's also a deeply environmental one um, insofar as it had deep environmental consequences because there is nothing protecting the earth from human beings. Um, remember, that's all that Home Baba did. He protected the forest, not from animals, not from gods, but from human beings. Without these religions more generally protecting the earth from human beings, um, there wasn't anything to stop the exploitation of the planet. And, and we're going to see that. And in terms of deforestation, we're going to see it. Yeah, what does it mean? The, this is the moment in the West where, and we're going to see it again and again, but this is the earliest one, where human beings proclaim that they were stronger than the environment and the deities they're protecting. Them. Because remember, if you're fearful that, you know, that, that, genus Loki of the river and all is going to lash back at you and hit you with the flood or whatever, or, you know, do something horrible with the forest and burn it down or something, which could happen, right? And how else would you interpret like a lightning storm? A god got mad and decided to burn the forest down. Um, 
if you are fearful of all those things, you again, you have to take a subordinate role to the local deities and and not touch the environment or not over exploit it. Sure, you could go and get some a few trees now and again as needed, but you would have to do it in a very respectful way. Otherwise, you know, you'd suffer the consequences of it. But here, this is something new because in part, the support of the metaphysical God, the belief is, you know, all bets are off. We're not going to care about those ancient deities. They're, that's an older religion and we don't care about that. And Gilgamesh starts the Western tradition, you know, as far as uh, the epic tradition here by saying, you know, we're going to cast it aside. We're going to do what we want. We're going to do whatever we want. We can do whatever we want to the planet because we have somebody on our side more powerful than these local deities. That's a problem. <laughs> Environmentally, that's that's a problem. And I'm, again, I'm not being critical of, of metaphysical type religion, but you can see where this will be a history, a problem in the history of the, um, of the West. So an epilogue. Um, deforestation followed Western civilization out of Mesopotamia and where the city of Iraq was 5,000 years ago to sweep through Europe and then North and South America. It's not too strong a statement to say that the history of Western civilization is a history of deforestation. And we're going to see it again and again. And it's it's going to move out of northern Africa. It's going to jump the Mediterranean and places like Greece and Italy through Europe into England. North America through, you know, North and South America and to other parts of the world where it's, you know, rampant right now, like Indonesia and all. That has been the history of Western culture. And um, we often think about resources, natural resources like oil and uh, fossil fuels, gas and coal and all being so important. Important. And they have been for the last, well, really 400 years, but especially in the last 200, 100 years, especially. But before that, the natural resources that mattered mo most were things like wood. Wood was incredibly important. I mean, you know, um, ships and all had to be built out of old timbers, masts had to have, you know, old growth forests and all. Wood was like one of the number one, you know, commodities that people had. If you're in control of forests, you had power. And, and that's throughout Western civilization. And then, you know, deforestation set the stage for, for um, you know, different types of agricultural projects. So you cut everything down, you deforest it, you get all that wood, which is good, but then you get the cleared land to, to grow things on or to raise sheep or things like that. So it's been a history of the West, and if you think of it from everything, the point of view of everything we just said about Gilgamesh, it's a disturbing history because it's um, an indifference to the planet completely. So human beings have needs, desires, ambitions like Gilgamesh, and we act them out by, by doing these things. So... Um, John Perlin, um, which is who's anthologized in the uh, the reader, uh, wrote this book, A Forest Journey. That, if you're interested in this topic, it's a very good book. John Perlin, incidentally, is an um, instructor at UCSB, um, but it's a good book because it, you know you're reading an early portion of it because it you know he's writing about you know, the beginning of all this 5,000 years ago. But John Perlin looks at it through the history of the West as a history of deforestation. And there are other books too, but um, John Perlin's book is a particularly readable one and interesting one. I think you'd, uh, you would might enjoy if you find this interesting. Um, and hopefully the, uh, the passage that you read from John is going to be uh, helpful. Um, a footnote to this, um, you know, mass deforestation significantly contributes to global warming as trees are highly uh, effective at carbon capture and sequestration. So um, trees can do a remarkable thing. You know, we're all worried about the rising levels of greenhouse gas emissions, principally CO2. Well, as you know, plants breathe in CO2 and exhale oxygen, just the opposite of us human beings and animals. Um, but they sequester that in their in their bodies in, in wood and all. So you had these massive, um, basically carbon sinks all over the planet where carbon was held in a pretty static form. So yes, trees would die, but then new trees would come up 
pipes, so uh, 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 you know, pound for pound, the number of CO2 sequestered or stored in forests pretty much stayed the same over a period of time. But as we cut them down, that created the problem. So, you know, the bigger problem, of course, is burning fossilized uh, plant material, fossil fuels. But also note that part of the problem here is what we did to these um, forests. Um, but it is noteworthy that in some places, some parts of the United States even, we're experiencing a period of reforestation. And parts of New England, they have more trees than they did 100 years ago. And, and that's a, um, it's an encouraging sign because it doesn't necessarily have to stop there, that we could enter a period of reforestation. Um, it largely began in the Renaissance. That's where we see that happening. I'm uh, sorry, I just jumped out of there. I wanted to come back. Um, that's where it really we see it beginning, this period of reforestation. But it, it couldn't keep up with the amount of deforestation happening at the time. And even now in places like the Amazon Basin in Indonesia, incredible amounts of deforestation are going on. And it's, it's, an, it's something to think about because it, it's so old and yet so very important. So in a way, we really need to sort of undo what happened in Gilgamesh's era in that, you know, we had all this period of deforestation, deforestation for 5,000 years. We really need to 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 enter in this new period of reforestation. And we need to have an ideology that allows that to happen. Gilgamesh had an ideology, religious conviction that allowed him to do what he did. We really think, need to think about how to, um, to rethink that today. Okay, so that's it for um, the Epic of Gilgamesh and lecture number two. Talk to you next time.